Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, may I extend a warm welcome to all participants on behalf of CII. Today, we have a webinar on digital master class on GST, special focus on IT and ITES industry. May I now take a few minutes to introduce Mr. Vinod Mandlik. Mr. Mandlik is the Global Head Indirect Taxes, Tata Consultancy Services Limited. Mr. Mandlik is an IIM Bangalore and Harvard Business School alumni, has over two and a half decades of rich experience in indirect tax administration, policy and industry practices. He is an active member of co-group formed by the government of Maharashtra for design and implementation of GST. Vinod is regular speaker on GST, indirect taxes and policy issues and has represented industry bodies in respect of indirect tax issues before Empower Committee, GST Council and central and state governments. May I request all participants to make a note that this webinar would be a one-way communication from CII. Any queries to be emailed to CIIWR at the rate CII.IN. I repeat, any queries to be emailed to CIIWR at the rate CII.IN. May I, on behalf of participants, extend a warm welcome to Mr. Mandlik and invite him to take over the session. Over to you, Mr. Mandlik and uh, welcome to the digital master class on uh, GST. Though uh, the special focus is on IT, ITS industry, but uh, it's uh, useful for all other industry because we are talking about GST issues, compliances, and how to resolve certain gray areas where uh, there is a, uh, no clarity as of now is achieved. So uh, today's agenda for uh, this uh, digital class is uh, we'll be taking, giving the background of IT industry and thereafter uh, what are the similarities or differences uh, in the Indian GST with uh, the global GSTs all over the world. And uh, then there are certain compliances like registration, how to tackle the transition uh, from the earlier regime to a GST regime and uh, We'll talk about the GST ecosystem, uh, returns and their due dates, and in transition, there are some changes in uh, due dates for filing of return, and certain important compliances, uh, particularly in respect of uh, IT industry, uh, there are certain issues which are unique and which need to be uh, dealt very carefully. So uh, we'll talk about uh, some seven, eight areas uh, under which uh, every business uh, or organization need to take care uh, during this transition, at least the GST gets stabilized. Uh, one important thing which I would like to uh, tell the participant that a GST is the biggest reform of this century. And it is touching upon all facets of uh, business. And therefore, uh, we need to be very careful regarding uh, the changes, updates, which are coming up from the government, because government is also, uh, we are together doing this uh, uh, transformation. It's actually a transformation. Government is issuing all the time, uh, regularly updates. They are listening to the industry. Uh, they, are, they are discussing the pain points and coming up with solutions. So whatever is told in the webinar, uh, you need to first of all check with uh, the law which is evolving and any updates are there on the particular aspect and then uh, check the uh, FAQs or as well as uh, Twitter updates which are given uh, by the government uh, on the issue uh, and based on that you form your opinion and take uh, whatever the decision your business need to take. So with this uh, uh, small uh, brief uh, background, let us move on to the actual presentation. Uh, see, uh, as we know that Indian IT industry is one of the uh, most important uh, kind of industry from the export perspective. 
because uh, the size of the industry is uh, almost uh, 160 billion dollars uh, and uh, the export out of is is uh, more than 70% uh, of uh, the services are exported. Uh, as we know that uh, Indian IT companies are operating uh, more than 78 countries. So I'm talking about the Indian IT companies having their presence across the globe. And they have uh, almost 670 offshore delivery centers. So we can imagine the kind of industry it has and which is uh, currently now we have to uh, go through the GST trans transformation. So more than one crore uh, employees directly or indirectly employed by this industry. And it's the largest contributor uh, to the Forex uh, revenue, uh, to uh, Forex currency reserve to the country. Uh, if we look at uh, the Indian GST, uh, though the GST is uh, said to be implemented in more than 140 countries, but the Indian, Indian GST is similar to this 140 uh, country GST, and it is also different in some aspect, and which is which are the very important features of the Indian GST. So uh, we cannot equate it with the global GST models adopted by various countries. Because we have, being a federal country and having a different kind of a political structure, uh, the GST has been changed considerably uh, uh, to uh, take care of Indian polity and Indian structure. Uh, let us look at the uh, features of Indian GST. Yes, the GST, Indian GST is also value added tax, which is destination based consumption tax. That means the tax will ultimately or tax uh, to the consumer where he is consuming the goods or services. However, uh, we call it as a one nation, one tax. The tax law is same. The provisions more or less are similar in all the states of India. But however, the tax is applied on a state level. The levy is on a state level. And therefore, we have SGST, which is a state tax, and there is a CGST, which is central tax. Uh, there are taxes on interstate supply. Generally, by and large, wherever uh, the goods or services are exported from the tax jurisdiction, these are not taxed in the and in India particularly, this is the major change in the structure of GST where this is a new feature. This is a, a, a kind of invention by India, which is called as a IGST. And all over the world, this is looked after by various tax administration as a tool uh, to remove the tax evasions under the GST. Because here, the export from one state to another is tax at the origin means the state which is exporting the goods or services, the person, the supplier is required to collect IGST paid to the government and government has created a network to comply with the GST law. Everybody has, even the tax administrator, government officials, as well as the taxpayers will connect with uh, the platform, which is IT platform created under a separate uh, kind of a company formed by the government, which is called as a GST networks, GSTN as a short form. So that uh, GSTN will collect all the taxes. So everybody has to go there to uh, get the registration, to file return, to do the compliance, to, compliances, and to make uh, payments under GST. Uh, so that GST network, you have to pay the IGST, which will be collected by the central government. However, will be distributed a 50% portion to the state where the goods are getting consumed. So government in turn, though the taxpayer is not aware about this um, uh, sharing of the revenue, but uh, on the digital platform, he is making only one single payment and he is specifying the place of supply where the goods are destined or where the services are getting consumed. 
and basis that the central government will transfer the IGST 50% revenue to the respective state. Uh, then the main feature of Indian GST is that the credits are available for all taxes which are uh, paid on uh, input side uh, of the business procures various kinds of goods and services and uh, on that the business is required to pay GST whether CGST, IGST and SGST or so all types of these GSTs credits are available except uh, a few uh, type of credits like uh, credits on a rent a cap services or employee welfare uh, type of services or uh, there are some uh, procurements which are uh, made for construction of immovable property except that uh, the credits are available to the business which can be used against uh, can be offset against the output tax payable by the business and there is a fungibility of the credits the IGST can be used to pay IGST as well as CGST and SGST whereas CGST and SGST can be uh, uh, used for payment of output CGST or I, uh, SGST respectively and as well as the IGST if uh, the credits are available are more than the output liability under the respective uh, taxes. So the credits are uh, more or less fully fungible. Um, the governance of uh, this GST is done by uh, a central council which is represented by finance minister of the states and the union finance minister uh, is the chairman of that council. So this council will take care uh, regarding uh, the issues which are arising out of uh, the GST implementation, the major changes uh, to be done uh, under the, uh, for the GST uh, rates or uh, GST regulation, law, notification, exemption, threshold limit. So this, these are taken uh, by consensus under uh, majority, I can say 75% uh, of uh, the majority votes uh, to go towards the decision taken by the GST Council. So there is a very strong constitutional uh, governance model which is in place so that uh, the GST law uh, will be implemented across the country uh, at a similar uh, kind of uh, provisions as well as uh, procedures uh, to be adapted by various things. Then uh, the major and important uh, point about Indian GST is that the compliance and administration of the GST is done online. Everybody has to connect to the system, uh, to the GST and portal and do the compliances, make the payment, seek the refund and the tax administration also uh, look towards this the GST and portal for all type of data they will require to administer the taxes, do the audit or uh, do some kind of uh, procedure changes, MIS, uh, they will get uh, through this uh, GST network. Uh, if we look at uh, the Indian GST, it's a very broad based tax, which is applicable on all kind of supply of goods or services by business. So this is a tax on a business. This is not tax on an individual. If somebody is selling out uh, maybe old furniture, from his home and replacing it with the new one. So this kind of sale will not attract any kind of GST because the tax is on the business. Those who are in business, they only require to pay the taxes under the GST and get registration. So it's a broad based tax, a broad based tax applicable on goods and services. It is not applicable on certain type of goods like electricity, alcohol, or uh, there may be your immobile property, uh, which is completely constructed building on which the GST is not applicable. Uh, but however, the uh, rest of the other uh, kind of uh, goods or services, uh, the tax is applicable. Well, let's move to uh, various kinds of uh, uh, compliances under the GST. The first and foremost is getting registered for the GST. Uh, if we look at uh, there are kind of registrations. One is, which is most of us is uh, known, is the migration 
kind of a registration where you you got a registration under earlier VAT service tax or a excise law, uh, which will get uh, transferred uh, to GST irrespective of uh, whether you are having a turnover of 20 lakhs threshold limit crossing the threshold limit or not. So that is a migration kind of a, a registration that also you are required to get connected to GST and site and upload certain details and get that result. Almost all of our members might have those who are listening uh, already got registered uh, under the GST uh, for the on the GST network. Uh, there are other registrations also we must know because uh, most of our suppliers, vendors, uh, they will come across many kind of uh, queries which uh, we must uh, uh, know uh, what kind of uh, regulation or what kind of provisions are applicable to them. The, the most important is that the registration is compulsory, uh, which is called as compulsory type of registration uh, for every state where the business is having an establishment. If you are doing a business for multiple states, you will require a multiple registration. If you are doing a business for one single state to your customer across India, so you have office at one place, but your customers are spread across the India, you require only one registration within that state. And that too, if you are crossing the turnover limit of 20 lakh in the previous year. So if, and for special states like Northeastern state and Jammu Kashmir and Uttarakhand, uh, there is a turnover limit of 10 lakh. It is reduced to 10 lakh. These are called as a special states. Then there is a voluntary registration. If somebody is not crossing uh, the turnover, uh, which is required for compensatory registration, still he can opt for a voluntary registration and uh, get registered for GST and charge GST to uh, the customer, which the customer can take credit. And there are certain special compulsory registration, which are required for um, interstate supply, those who are doing interstate supply, irrespective of their turn or they are required to get registered uh, for GST. The person who is uh, required to pay reverse charge liability is also need to get registered, though he's turn on maybe uh, less than 20 lakhs. And th those vendors, those who are dealing, uh, they are doing a business on an e-commerce platform, then they are also required to get registered uh, irrespective of their turn. Uh, registration for uh, business verticals. See, this is another kind of decision. You may have two kind of businesses and you are keeping a separate books of account for these two businesses which are separate in that case. Uh, though these two verticals are operating from single state, you will require to get registered uh, differently uh, if you wish to. So this is an optional kind of a registration. If you uh, want a separate registration for a separate business vertical you have, you can take that. That facility is given under the law. Then there is a, uh, this is very important for the, uh, from the IT, IT, uh, EES industry perspective that those who are operating from special economic zones, uh, if you got multiple units in a state, uh, SEZ units, then you can opt for a single registration. Uh, but if you got a developer status in that state under ACZ, then uh, that should be a different registration because the GST uh, network uh, where you get registered, a developer is treated as a, a different kind of a vertical and you are compulsorily required to get registered separately for that. So a multiple ACZ unit you can club into one registration if the units are situated in only one state. If units are situated in multiple states, then you will require separate registration for each of that unit uh, in that particular state. Irrespective that you got a registration for all your other offices in that state, which we can call as a DTA registration. Uh, then uh, we look into certain 
the important aspect about how there are major aspect of transition to GST because we were dealing with earlier multiple laws. Certain laws where uh, the business the businesses were used to take credits of input taxes which are paid like under a service tax or excise or a CVD paid under a customs act <coughs> for the imports done or uh, the VAT which is charged by the uh, your supplier. So these uh, taxes actually uh, we used to get credit of because these taxes were based on a value add uh, principle. Uh, so what will happen with these credits uh, when we are transiting towards the GST? As we are aware, uh, the closing balance of uh, state <coughs> VAT credits and um, the credits under excise and service tax uh, is allowed, but it is subject to certain conditions. It is allowed to be taken under a GST and there is a specific return which is prescribed which is called as a trans one return under which we need to reflect these uh, closing balances of credit line with the business under the existing law which is pre GST laws. So uh, this actually uh, we need to deal very carefully about flowing uh, these credits uh, to the GST uh, GST credits actually. So there are conditions as I told you. <clears throat> the first and foremost is that this the credit which we are flowing to GST must be a type which are eligible as an input credit under the earlier law as well as under the GST law. Uh, let's take example. So maybe we we got a rent a cap kind of a services and which were not allowed under the real law, which are not allowed under uh, the current law also, and therefore uh, these credits will not be available to be flown to GST. Uh, <clears throat> then second condition is that uh, the person who is availing this kind of credit, he must have filed returns under the pre-existing uh, pre GST law for the last six months. That means from January 2017 to June 2017, the returns under the old law need to have been filed. Then uh, in case of service providers, when uh, they are availing this kind of uh, credit against uh, the input taxes which are paid for the services available. So the person who is availing credit may be a service provider, trader or a manufacturer whatever, but if he is taking a credit of services under the old law, in that situation he will be, uh, he need to pay the service provider within 90 days. So that is also within three months the payment need to be made. Otherwise, the credit is not eligible to be taken and need to be reversed. Then input credit for the pre-GST uh, taxes uh, for invoices which are getting booked after for July. So we talked initially now about the closing balances. So the, what are the conditions which are required to be fulfilled for taking the closing balance credit. Now we, we will take up the issue of the invoices which are received by the business for services provided or the goods supplied prior to fund July 2017, which are getting booked under a GST period in the books of account of the person taxpayer. These credits are available only if invoices are accounted on or before 30th of July 2017. This is very important. If you get an invoice in the month of August, or a subtable, then as per the current interpretation of the provision, the credits are not available. Yes, this has been represented by the industry to the government that they should give some kind of a relaxation regarding this provision. 
let us see that what uh, government takes a decision on this and then probably you may be uh, either take a decision about whether to avail a credit for invoices received in the month of August or September or thereafter uh, either to take credit or to expense of the taxes in charge. Uh, the payment as already I told you which need to be made to the vendor uh, by 30th of September. The details of such credits or goods in stock because in case of goods the goods may be lying in your stock need to be filed by 30th of uh, July in form trans 1 so it's not a July actually as such so it is by 30th of September 2017 that is a correction required in that. so within 90 days you have to take a trans credit but if if you want that credit need to be flown to the current month then the government has given that option by 28th of uh, August you should have filed the transfer and you could have taken a credit against your output tax used to be used against the output tax liability of July and if you are not done it yet you can still file the transfer form uh, and get that uh, to be adjusted against uh, August month liability payable uh, by your business so that is also possible so but uh, for that also you need to account all these invoices having uh, service tax or VAT charge or excise charge need to be accounted uh, by 30th of July so that seems to be a common for all. Uh, let's look uh, exactly what is happening if invoices prior to 30th June with VAT or service tax or excise to be booked in June 2017 if if these are booked in June 2017 then uh, you might have claimed the credit in the month of June and which will flow as a transitional closing balance there is no issue on that. if the accounting of these invoices is happening in the month of July then still you have option given by the government to take this credits under a trans one form and if the invoices are getting booked after July then no credit will be available so that is as of today the situation if invoices after 30th June 2017 with service tax and VAT this need to be booked in the month of July to claim under a trans one if not booked in July then no credit and the invoices which are with GST though the services might have been provided earlier but the service provider has took a decision that he feels that this point of taxation is arising under a GST period and therefore charging the GST on that then still we can claim uh, credit for the, these services which are received prior but billed with GST under a GST regime as a normal GST credit. Now uh, in transition we must uh, remember one thing the business is in continuation so there are multiple type of contracts maybe on a purchase side where we have given a purchase contract or we might have given our sales side my clients have given me a multi uh, year kind of a contract or a contract which runs into uh, multiple years or a multiple months and which was also having some portion is executed prior to GST implementation and after GST implementation so in uh, both of these cases we will require to change the contractual conditions because the GST is a tax where it's a value added tax, credits are available subject to fulfillment of certain conditions. And the most important condition 
is that credit is available only if it is getting matched on GST, GSTM. So the vendor will supply, uh, vendor will uh, provide these details of invoices on which the GST is charged to the GSTM side as well as the recipient also need to provide these kind of details and once these are matched then only the credit is available. So therefore the contracts need to have certain clauses which compel the vendor to do certain kind of compliances and we suggest so this is something out of our practical experience we suggest that whenever you are issuing POs to your vendors please incorporate your GSTN number in the PO as well as mention where the vendor need to bill you because the address of that and the GSTN number the vendor must use in his invoice and to provide that detail to GSTN side so that there should not be any mismatch thereafter because once the invoice is raised and reported to GSTN cancelling that will be a tedious procedure. So to avoid this kind of challenges we suggest that POs need to incorporate these details and secondly there should be some kind of a provision or condition under which the vendor need to be obligated for paying the taxes on time and reporting correct details to GSTN so that credit should not be lost. Uh, there is a chart in this slide which gives you idea about which taxes in the earlier regime were becoming or forming part of the cost to every business. So considering this you can arrive at the new price under the GST. So if the contract is already entered and negotiated you need to look at these taxes which were earlier not available as a credit to the vendor. Based on that there need to be a price correction and with that then you can renegotiate the contract and realign the prices with the GST provisions so that you will be paying taxes which will be more or less the same taxes under the GST. The rate of tax is same but certain taxes which were forming a part of sale price, the base sale price are now coming up as a tax line on the invoice. So therefore these need to be removed from the basis and for that purpose the existing contract need to be relooked into. Uh, transition to GST, uh, one of the important aspect in transition is capturing most of us uh, capturing the detail in the system. So most of the businesses are using some kind of a IT program and uh, under that IT software they are maintaining their books of accounts. So there generally there are vendor masters and the client masters which are maintained uh, so that there should not be a repetitive kind of a information to be provided to the system for generating the invoices on the client or for receiving invoices in the system from the vendor because these transactions are not one time transaction many of the vendors or the clients are same to whom we are dealing um, for a long period. So, this vendor and client registration under your system a need to incorporate the accurate GSTN number of the vendor as well as the client. And similar thing also we must expect and we need to communicate to our vendor as well as our clients to incorporate in their system uh, the GSTN number of your organization. So capturing this detail accurately and there may be a possibility the vendor or a client may have multiple sites and multiple registration under GST. Each of that site and registration need to be captured carefully 
and whenever we are uh, issuing invoices that need to be populated uh, uh, to take care of GST compliances as well as uh, incorporating that on the invoice because this will reduce uh, your mismatches under GST, your cancellation of invoices and the pain points which we will face in next two months where there will be a kind of uh, education, awareness, uh, which is required to be created amongst the vendors particularly, those who are small vendors, SMEs, with whom we are dealing, they may not be aware about the GST provisions and accurately capturing and providing these details on the GST, which will eventually uh, result into a non-availability of credits and credits is a backbone of any kind of value added tax and no business will accept this to not to avail the credits which are eligible so which will be having a direct impact on your bottom line so therefore it is important to capture the details carefully and vis-a-vis -vis that you can you can make a provision to capture contact details of the person from uh, the client or a vendor organization with whom you can talk to or send an email when there is any query or any mismatch, any clarification or any submission of the provision, uh, submission of the information is required to be provided. So contact details must be there and we also track the compliance rating, though it will not be operative uh, in the initial uh, stages. But within a year's time, the GSTN portal will provide everybody's compliance rating based on the uh, compliances made by the business. And that rating uh, will have, um, this can be used as a decision point whether to deal with any particular vendor or not. Because sometime after, if somebody is failing on a compliances, GSTN will uh, block also. So they may, they may cancel the registration of that vendor and uh, one should not deal with the vendor, those who are not complying with the law to avoid any kind of uh, credit loss or any kind of uh, inquiry which will come up thereafter. So now let us talk about the GST ecosystem, how this is made. Most of us may be aware about it, but those who are not for them, uh, just we want to say that there is a system which is in within our organization, which is we call it as a ERP system under which we record our transaction, business transaction, maybe of sale, purchase, and other HR related or maybe payroll related transactions. Then these from this ERP system, we need to generate a report which need to be fed to the GSTN portal, one is a sales report, another is a purchase report and basis that the GSTN uh, portal will calculate the taxes applicable and payment to be made in cash by your business. So these reports when the volumes are more then it will require some kind of IT system uh, to help you uh, in doing the compliances and for that purpose the GSTN portal has provided certain APIs uh, to the GSPs, they have created a kind of a, uh, their um, supporters, I can say. These are the people, those who are working as a GSP. So a GST in portal allowed them to work as a GSP, which the GSPs will be having a dedicated kind of a connectivity and they can use the API and port the data, which your data, which may be a voluminous data. Uh, to the GST portal uh, in a safe and dedicated uh, kind of a way. So you need to choose uh, uh, one of the G GSPs uh, to upload your data on, uh, on the portal if your business transactions are uh, voluminous. Uh, the small players can use offline utilities which are created uh, by uh, and uh, distributed by GST portal as well as uh, the central government. So these offline utilities uh, can be used by the small businesses, but the large businesses or medium scale businesses, uh, they will need to have some kind of a 
computer assisted kind of a compliance uh, which uh, compliance service provider which is a gsp and there are certain uh, people uh, those who are acting as asp asp is a application service provider application suvidha provider so application suvidha providers are uh, people those uh, who will be looking into your ERP system, customizing some application for you, which from which uh, they can pull the data from your ERP system, provide that to GSP and GSP can upload it. So the total people involved in this is a GSTN, which is a portal. Then there are GSPs and there are ASPs. Certain GSPs are acting as ASPs also. They can help you. The most precaution the uh, business should take that they need to look at who is the GSP, what kind of infrastructure they have, whether they, they can they can withstand the load on the last day uh, when the everybody is trying to get in get on to the GST and upload the data. And even if you are ready to comply with the tax law and your data is ready, but you are not in a position to upload on GST and portal. It will be treated as a non-compliance and therefore it is very important when you are choosing a GSP, let us look at their infrastructure, look at their uh, SLAs, uh, what time they will be loading, what kind of bandwidth they are providing, what kind of security infrastructure they have because it's a whole data of sale and purchases of your business which will flow through uh, a kind of a VPN structure. So there should be a data security uh, also need to be checked uh, while choosing the GSPs. So uh, this is the way uh, we can do our compliances uh, on a GSTN portal. Uh, then let us look at what are these compliances. Uh, so the first uh, we, we talked about registration once we got a registration that every supplier or every taxpayer is required to file a return on a GSTN portal and these returns uh, mainly uh, are GSTR1 which is a sales register which need to be uploaded by 10th of every month uh, next next month I'm saying for the completed month uh, the next 10th uh, of the next month you have to file the GSTN uh, portal the GSTR1 sales register then GSTR2 is a purchase register. It is auto-populated by GSTN looking at the supply uh, GSTR1 which are provided by the suppliers of your business on a GSTN with your unique tax code ID basis that the system will calculate and populate that uh, GSTR2 purchase register. Uh, which will be flown to you. You can make add, delete or amend other uh, entries uh, on that GSTR2 uh, and GSTR3 is the monthly return which need to be filed by 20th of uh, the next month. This return is nothing but uh, GSTR1 and GSTR2 combined put together and most of the fields are auto populated in this monthly return. And uh, along with this return, before uh, filing this return, you will need to make payment uh, uh, to the GSTN uh, side, on the GSTN side to the central and state government uh, for the SGST and CGST. And if your IGST tax is payable, then you have to make payment of IGST tax. There are 20 uh, banks which are authorized to make payment. Uh, so you can check on the GSTN side. Uh, for the bank details and you can make online payment if any taxes are required to be paid by your business. If you have sufficient input credits which are lying in your registered ledger which is maintained by the GST portal then you need not to make any cash payment but if cash payments uh, the, the credits are not sufficient then you will require to make uh, the difference by making payment of uh, by way of uh, cash online through a bank. So uh, and second most important aspect here is that when we are making reverse charge payment that also need to be made uh, by way of uh, online cash payment. 
So I am talking here cash doesn't mean the actual uh, currency, but it's an online payment by way of uh, uh, through a bank, I can say, or a credit card or debit card. So uh, there is one another return which is prescribed for first two months, that is July and August, which is uh, GSTR 3B. Uh, this return is a summary return where uh, you have to show your liabilities and your input credits and the remaining, uh, if there is a difference, then make a cash payment towards it. So dates for these returns uh, were now the July date just over, which was on 28th is the last date if uh, somebody is filing a transfer return also and taking a credit, but otherwise it was a 25th. Uh, August was the date for 3B for the month of July. And for uh, the month of uh, August, the 3B return must be filed by 20th of September. There is another return which every business has to file is an annual return under a GSTR 9. The format is not yet available, but this will be made available in due course uh, by the CBAC or the state governments. So, but that is the return at the end after September you have to file. Then there is another compliance which is important compliance to be made by businesses. Those who are having more than 2 crore worth of turnover, they need to get audited their books of account for GST purpose by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant. So, that is a compulsory GST audit uh, one need to go through if their turnover is above 2 crore. Then this is a chart which is depicting the due dates uh, for returns, the various kinds of returns and due dates. Wherever there are uh, no dates mentioned, these are actually auto-populated kind of returns. So most of them uh, we have discussed the main uh, three are very important and uh, others are very special returns like for composite dealers or composition dealer or um, maybe for tax, uh, non uh, tax resident, non resident or uh, TDS, uh, tax deducted at source or TCS, uh, tax collected at source kind of thing. Uh, let's move to uh, some more uh, other aspect which are important for I, uh, from the IT industry perspective. Uh, the first and foremost is the export what will happen with the export and the major change here everybody must look into is that though the IGST tax talks about exports are zero rated or uh, that means the tax is not applicable on export but the credits on inputs are available to the exporter that means there will not be any taxes getting exported either on a purchase side or a sales side. So that is a good thing which uh, the government has done. The export are zero rated so that our Indian industry should uh, be having a competitive edge in the global market and keep their prices of goods and services competitive. But uh, there are conditions for this zero rating. These are safeguards uh, to, to stop certain people misusing these provisions. The first uh, thing is that the exporter need to provide letter of undertaking to get the zero rating kind of a exemption. So letter of undertaking is provided to the exporter those who are having either export status like a star trade house or uh, some kind of a status under uh, the FTP uh, because they were doing regularly the exports in volumes. So th they can file uh, this letter of undertaking. Um, uh, no questions will be asked to them. Uh, to the jurisdiction authority uh, of central government or the state government and once uh, the letter of undertaking is accepted, uh, they can make uh, zero rated exports. Uh, there is another uh, provision which is uh, if uh, those who are not having an export of one crore or they were not having a status, they are not a status holder under FTP, then 
uh, these people uh, can file a bond uh, which is the bond actually requires some kind of a surety or a bank guarantee which need to be given to the jurisdiction officer but it is the discretion of the commissioner whether to ask for a bank guarantee or not in any case the bank guarantee will not be more than 15 percent of the tax uh, which will come if the export um, i can say if the service provider is not getting um, the money for this exports then only uh, he is required to pay that much of amount so for the time for which the money is blocked generally if your business cycle uh, is that you give credit of suppose 60 days to your client in that case you will require to calculate the tax on the export of that 60 days and pay 15 percent of that tax so it works on that basis so that is the bank guarantee amount you have to give 15 percent of the tax payable on two months of export because you get money within two months all the time you need to monitor this and if you require a more kind of a value to the bond if you increase your export and there is an increased period of credit given then probably you will require to give more uh, bank guarantee in that case the exports uh, are under a follow any transaction is qualified as export based on the following uh, one the recipient should be outside india the goods to be exported within three months and the consideration for the services exported should be received within one year from the date of export under a convertible foreign exchange if you are doing the export to nepal bhutan or a Bangladesh, probably you may be getting money in Indian rupees. That will not qualify as export, and you are required to pay taxes, service tax. Earlier we used to pay similarly, uh, no, not under the earlier regime because this uh, we were not allowed to take into credit regarding uh, this kind of export to Bhutan and all this. But under the GST law, you will be required to pay upfront uh, GST, IGST particularly on any export made to Nepal, Bhutan or Bangladesh against INR. So the currency received, consideration is receivable under INR. Um, now the similar kind of treatment of zero rating is provided to SEZ units and developer for their procurements done under SEZ. So supply to and from SEZ uh, which is very important here uh, to note that SEZ is all the time dealing with somebody that transaction is treated as an interstate transaction. So no SGST is chargeable to any supply made to uh, the SEZ unit. So all the time it will be IGST which uh, the person is required to but most of the time it is not required because zero rating is provided. So the, there will not be any tax uh, on the SEZ units uh, when the supplier is making any supply to SEZ. Uh, but if supplier failed to obtain the letter of undertaking or, uh, or the bond and he want to supply, still he can make a supply by paying taxes and seeking refund of that from his jurisdictional officer. So that facility is also available to the supplier. Uh, secondly, the SEZ unit uh, required to be required to get registered separately uh, than their DTA officers within the same state. All SEZ units within the same state, already we talked about this, uh, can have a single registration. All supplies to SEZ unit and developer, which can be, I said that, without tax under a bond and LUT. And alternatively, the refund option is also available to the supplier by paying the taxes on his own and seeking the refund. Every supplier to SEZ is also required to get registered. So even if you have a gardener or somebody who is working for SEZ, it has been um, clarified also by the government under FAQ that the person of those who are supplying to SEZ 
is a IGST supply and IGST law requires every supplier to get registered and therefore any supplier maybe he is supplying within the same state where the SEZ is situated still he will require to get registered is irrespective of turn or is falling below the threshold limit uh, for uh, the supply which is made to SEZ. The supply is by SEZ to DTA is treated as a normal supply, but the IGST will be chargeable on this, uh, this kind of supply. Then we know that IT industry mostly uh, we are uh, exporting our services either from SEZ or STP. STP is a form of a software technology park uh, units, which are nothing but a kind of a export oriented unit. So, uh, these units really used to get tax concessions under excise law or under VAT law in some cases. Uh, CST also was uh, even the opera was not reviewable on certain purchases by STP. Uh, but all procurements uh, were not uh, exempted earlier also. There were few specified kind of a procurement by STP units which were uh, not chargeable to XI duty or a CVD. Uh, and the services anyway were chargeable to tax you know, under the pre-GST laws also. Uh, but under a GST, uh, this kind of a status is not there for the STP units to avail any kind of exemption. So all supplies, taxable supplies to STP units or UO units are chargeable to tax GST at a normal rate. Uh, exports by STP units or UO are not chargeable to tax under a LUT or one. However, the refund of taxes paid on input against the export are available uh, as a credit and it is available uh, as a refund also. So you can you can claim refund against it from the authorities. And they have simplified the refund mechanism and the government says that within seven days they will process 90% of the refund. The most important thing under GST, there is for claiming any refund, there is no excess required. Only it should be a business expense. You should be uh, paying the taxes to your supplier. Supplier has reported it. You can flow it into your credit input credit register and you can use it against your output tax liability if any balance remain that can be claimed as a export refund. Uh, exemption by, uh, from the basic custom duty on a specified uh, kind of a goods is always available. So that earlier also this was available to the STP unit and currently also that is maintained. So if BCD is chargeable on any imports made by STP unit and these kind of goods are allowed under STP scheme to be not to be charged with the custom duties. In such situation you can claim the BCD exemption being a STP unit by purchasing it under a bond. So these are bond uh, under a bond kind of purchases. Uh, then the domestic supply uh, by this unit is chargeable to CGST, HGST or IGST. Uh, if it's an interstate supply, then IGST. Uh, STP units can be clubbed with your other offices within the state except the SEZs. SEZs are separate, but STP can be clubbed with your DTA units and seek a single registration, common registration for these units. So uh, now the most uh, uh, other important kind of uh, aspect. So I have listed down the aspects which are uh, important compliance aspects uh, from the IT perspective. And there is one another is supply to own branches. So earlier we used to know under a VAT law, when the VAT CST law particularly, 
when any goods from your one office in one state are transferred to other office, we used to call it as a branch transfer, which was subject to uh, the CST, CST chargeable on that goods. And if the receive, receiving unit can provide the form F under the CST Act, then the tax was not paid. So for goods purpose, we were aware that if there was a concept called as a branch transfer or a consignment sale, which is called earlier. But under services, there was no this kind of concept uh, under the service tax law was there because we were for all India there was only one single authority which was which was taxing uh, the output taxes for the organization and therefore they were not recognizing uh, the intra-unit kind of services for service tax purposes because it was service to sell. But under the GST law, there is a legal fiction which is created under which the another unit uh, the, in other state is treated distinctly uh, as deemed to be a separate entity uh, than the unit in one uh, other state. So the two units under two different states are treated as a distinct person liable for tax. Therefore, any intra-unit supply also need to suffer a taxes. And the taxes should be at a normal rate. And uh, for that, you require to follow the all norms like uh, generating a tax invoice, though it is invoice on self. For GST purpose, you require to create an invoice and show the taxes on that invoice, which will be IGST in all possibilities when the supply is between two states. If supply is between within the same state within two verticals, then probably the SGST and CGST will attract. Mm. Uh, any uh, interstate or supply to SCZ will attract the IGST in that case and the value of supply uh, need to be because this is supply to self we will not have a commercial value defined under this uh, type of transaction be it a service provided by one unit to other unit or be it a service uh, goods provided or transport from one office to another office. In such situation, uh, the best thing is that you need to find it out, open market value of that product, same product, and take that as a value. Or uh, there are various valuation uh, uh, methods which are prescribed under the rules. Uh, you can adapt that in a chronology, uh, and the basis that you can do the valuation. The one concession which the government has uh, provided in case of uh, these branch transfers that uh, they said uh, if the recipient unit is eligible for full input credit of taxes which are charged by their vendors in that situation if any transfer by another unit of the same entity need uh, which is done on a, a specific valuation whatever the valuation could be that will be deemed to be treated as a open market value. So that means if uh, suppose a computer which is or a server we can say transferred from your Maharashtra office to maybe a Delhi office. In that case, if you have treated it, let's assume 10,000 as a value of that particular server, and the market value is, let's assume, a 1 lakh rupee. In that case, the authorities will not question why you have treated it as a 10,000 if your Delhi unit is eligible for full credit. That means that this is just to avoid litigation on this point of valuation. The government has provided this kind of a concession to the industry, and you can derive your open market value if the unit is eligible for full credit and there is dispute there is some gray area in respect of what is to be called as a full input credit uh, see more 
most of the cases like the banking companies are not eligible for full credit they may not get into this kind of they, they may not get this concession but the rest of the other people those who are providing maybe a little bit of output services exam service but the majority of their services are taxable service services then probably uh, that can be treated as a uh, fully eligible as an input credit and therefore uh, the valuation uh, can be any book value of the you know, that goods which is provided or maybe a cost of service what is provided. Uh, you can adopt another uh, kind of a valuation mechanism by under which uh, the cost of services let's assume uh, you can uh, it is 100 and then you can add a 10 percent to it and just raise a bill charge IGST and take credit of that IGST in the recipient brand. So it's that way revenue neutral. This is just a treatment which need to be given to pass on the credit to the consumption state. And you can utilize that credit. If we don't charge any taxes on branch transfer, then the credit chain will get blocked and the credit will get blocked in one state where you are not in a position to utilize. So that way it is helpful to the business to reduce the working capital requirement. So we need to adapt the proper procedure in the business uh, to record the transaction, internal transactions uh, within the units. And um, you can choose to charge uh, once in a month, one kind of invoice for all uh, transfer of services. And each uh, time when you are uh, transferring the goods, you will require to raise the invoice separately. But services, you can raise only a single invoice. Then uh, supply to overseas branches. If some units are supplying services to their own branches outside India, uh, in that case, uh, that will not be qualified as an export. So therefore, uh, there is there is no um, uh, tax as such IGST uh, will be chargeable as such as well as uh, because this is also one of the point contentious point where because this whether this qualify as a supply is a is a question so one branch of a supply a, a taxpayer supplying services to its own office outside the country can it get qualified under the definition of supply is a point of interpretation. So this will not qualify as export is known, but whether this is chargeable to IGST is a gray area. One need to take a considerate opinion on this and move ahead with uh, charging taxes on this kind of transaction if you have. But then there is another uh, the compliance uh, which will be bothering all of us which is not currently made uh, applicable to all uh, but in due course maybe within a month or two months or three months down the line it will come up because we have already got the way bill rules and uh, these rules uh, specify uh, that every movement of goods above 50,000 to be compulsory accompanied by a wig. If you are transferring goods from your one office to another office in another location, then you will require to generate a way bill on a GST and mention the details of the goods and the transport vehicle and other details and provide that way bill along with the um, your internal invoice if required and if it is not then the delivery chalan if it is within the uh, within the same uh, registration number uh, then it will be supported with a delivery chalan as well as the VP. These provisions are not yet made applicable. This will be live in due course, maybe within a, a two months or three, three months down the line. But at that point of time, uh, we must have a system within the organization and the, every stakeholder must understand this. Whenever they are moving the company assets, uh, then they will require to generate uh, way bills and then uh, transfer these assets. Uh, if they do something uh, without that, then probably it's a non-compliance and uh, there may be a stoppage of goods and inspection of goods by the tax authorities. So 
uh, there is one one important point in respect of uh, this is particularly for the IT industry that our associates are mobile and they are carrying their laptops with them. Uh, what will happen to that? If the laptops are below fifty thousand, then there is no no issue at all. They can carry uh, on their own. But if they are above uh, fifty thousand, then what will be the treatment to these laptops? Actually, this has been represented to the government. And some kind of concession in regard with the laptop or uh, this uh, uh, your projectors uh, is expected from the government. Some relaxation in this. So there are some three parts of uh, this uh, part A and part B of the way bill. One is uh, part A is filled by the person causing the movement, and part B to be by the uh, transporters or so transporter de details. And there is an important aspect of the vehicle. The recipient must accept the vehicle. So you need to take care wherever uh, your unit. So somebody need to every day check on the GST inside how many vehicles are generated against their GSTN number by whom. And if these are uh, their purchases, they are expecting these kind of supplies to be made to their unit then they should accept this and if not then they have to reject it because somebody can misuse their name or number and uh, can move the goods and tomorrow the recipient uh, unit will be held responsible and maybe ask question what they uh, did with that supply so therefore uh, one thing is internally there should be awareness amongst the all stakeholders that uh, movement of any goods should be only with the way bills and with the approval of the finance people from the organization. Um, the finance person must know that and the recipient uh, office also uh, need to accept this uh, way bill uh, supply, supply through a way bill. Uh, because if they won't accept uh, within a specified time, then that will be treated as a good supply to that unit if the way bill is not cancelled. Uh, the way bill is for limited period, so it depends upon the kilometers, how far the destination is, and based on that, there is a time limit uh, specified for the way bill. Um, all the way bills uh, which are generated uh, are available on the GST network, and one need to go and see that. Then another uh, compliance. Uh, which is a little bit difficult to comply, I can say initially at least, since the processes and procedures, internal procedures need to be um, aligned with this kind of a compliance uh, by every organization is a tax payable on procurements or a purchases, which is generally called as a reverse charge. So this is a tax on a inward supply so whenever you are purchasing something uh, the first thing is that importing any goods or services from outside india then you are required to pay tax if the goods are imported it is getting paid as igst uh, when the custom clearance is made but the services are imported then you will be required to calculate on your own uh, this uh, tax under reverse charge which need to be paid uh, in cash so that is tax on import there is another tax which is uh, which need to be taken care of which was not there earlier under our uh, earlier law which is tax on a supplies made by unregistered dealer uh, there are various kind of supplies which are procured by the businesses maybe stationary or maybe some taxi service or a bus service or plane tickets or many things which are purchased by uh, either by the employees of the organization and they pay on their own uh, for the supplies because uh, there is urgency and they can't wait for till uh, their accounts department release money to the supplier so these are spontaneous kind of a purchases immediately need to be done so tracking this purchase because these are claimed as expenses are claimed as reimbursement by employees and there is a view 
that any reimbursement made by the business to the employees is something a purchase by the business. So it's a huge point actually because daily these kind of transactions are happening and uh, we may not be uh, recording it in our system because uh, the bills are kept in the record uh, these are required for income tax purpose but not getting captured as such okay, what exactly is purchased and from whom it is purchased whether the person who is supplying is registered or not if the person supplying is unregistered in such situation we will be as a taxpayer under a GST required to calculate tax because the supply is from unregistered dealer and pay it to the government. Now uh, these uh, there are uh, two kind of unregistered purchases unregistered purchase unregistered dealer purchases of goods or services by the business itself which can be easily captured because you are getting directly uh, that invoice from the uh, supplier as well as the payment is made by the accounts department which can be captured in the system but the employee reimbursement you need to devise some system process or a manual process under which you have to segregate the supplies which are from the registered dealer and supplies from unregistered dealer find it out the exact HSN code for the service or goods and pay the taxes appropriately as per the applicable rate uh, to that goods or services to the government. Uh, then uh, there are procurements which are done by employees and director we talked about. Then in this uh, unregistered dealer uh, supplies, if there are certain supplies which are non taxable under GST or exempted then that need not to be considered. Uh, there are other domestic suppliers where the supplier may be a registered person but you will require to pay tax on that which is domestic reverse charge we call it. So these are type of goods the GTA services good transport services or the lawyer who has given a legal services to us which is also required to be paid under a reverse charge. For a sponsorship, which uh, sponsor uh, we are acting as a sponsor, your, your organization is sponsoring the event. In that case, the tax is payable by the sponsoring organization. Um, if certain government is providing services to your business, then the tax is payable in the hands of the recipient. The government may be registered or may not, government department may be registered or may not. Director sitting fees and their commission is also required to be paid by the companies. Insurance agent also these kind of services are to be paid by the insurance company. Original IPR uh, where the writer is writing uh, for the maybe a newspaper or a magazine or the IPR is getting created in that case. It is the liability of the business who is seeking that service from the writer. So that business has to pay tax. And there is a prepared import freight which is recently brought in kind of uh, which we may not deal much because it just on uh, import of goods from outside India where the freight is included in the cost. Uh, if we look at uh, the other compliance which is uh, input tax credit so we talked about the input tax credit is a backbone of a GST system without that and that is the main attraction of any kind of GST tax system actually where the businesses are just passing on the credits. They are not required to take it as a cost and therefore um, the businesses are happy to pay the taxes because they are collecting the taxes they are paying taxes on their procurement, taking the credit of the taxes on the taxes collected and paying the net taxes to the government. So in that case, uh, the input credit of GST charged by the supplier will be available to the recipient. By and large it is available, but on a completion of conditions. The first condition is that supplier is required to pay GST within a time. So supplier has to file the return. 
he has to disclose the details of this supply on a GSTN portal along with the GSTN number of the recipient. So he is required to pay that tax also. So it should not be an unpaid kind of a return or return uh, is not filed within a time kind of situation. If that is done, uh, then the recipient would not be uh, eligible to, to take the credit unless uh, the supplier may file a late return also. But if he files that, then only the credit is available. And the invoice voice breakup also need to be provided, which that means the recipient and supplier both should know each other's GSTN number, report it accurately on a GSTN site along with the invoice number and other details of the invoice like the tax amount, HSN code and Though the uh, matching will be done on five parameters, HSN is not one of that, but still the effort should be done for the businesses that most of the content of the invoices which are reported by the supplier and reported by uh, the recipient should match. Then uh, when there is, because the business uh, many times we have to cancel the invoice. Once the invoice is given and which is reported to GSTN, the cancellation need to be by way of a credit note and the credit note need to be accepted by the recipient also. So the data which will be uploaded to GSTN is of the invoice, original invoice, thereafter the credit note and both need to be reported by the recipient also. Though he is not accepting the invoice, then only the supplier will get reversal of the taxes shown on his original invoice. Now for taking the input credits, Tax invoice is the document, which is the important document, uh, and which is like a, your bank check. When we write their amount, that amount gets deposited in another person who is depositing that check into the bank, his account. So similarly, when we are issuing a tax invoice, the tax shown on that is as good as this is the money which is given buy a seller to a purchaser and purchaser can utilize it as a credit and pay less taxes to the company. So therefore it is important for any business to take care that their invoices should be compliant with the law. Then what is the law regarding the tax invoice? The tax invoice first thing it should be serial number in a consecutive manner the characters in that invoice number should not be more than 16. It can be alphanumeric. You can use multiple series, but you will need to report all the series and how many invoices you are generated within a month to the GSTN site. So in the return, you have to give that details. Then you can use hyphen or a slash or a combination thereof and it should be unique for a financial year. Your invoice number within a financial year should not repeat otherwise it will be called as a duplicate invoice. Then it, there should be a date of issue, name address and GSTN number of the supplier, name address and GSTN number of the recipient. Actually the recipient should give all these details in their purchase order is on the vendor so that the vendor uh, will take it from the purchase order and there should not be any uh, confusion and any correction further after raising the invoice required. Then there should be harmonized system nomenclature code of the goods or services, a description of the goods or services, quantity maybe in units, meter, kilo, liter, whatever the quantity of the goods total value of the supply of goods and services both and the taxes shown separately. 
So that should be uh, included in the tax increase. Uh, further, uh, it should have the tax line, as I said, that the GST, central GST, state GST, or IGST, or union territory GST. Or there will be says also that separate separate line should appear on the invoice. Amount of tax charge, how much tax is collected, the place of supply, which is very important because for the services and goods, there is a, a one specific field you should have in, on the invoice where you will mention that the place of supply in two alphabets you have to mention and there is a master given by GSTN for each of the state. Like for Maharashtra, there is a MH is there. So you need to mention that and report it to the uh, GSTN site in your return about uh, this place of supply. Then address and uh, of delivery uh, where the same is different from the place of supply. So many uh, cases, the our client may ask us to deliver goods or services, maybe at a different location, but raise invoice on a specific location. In that case, we can have that under a bill to ship to model. Whether the tax is payable on a reverse charge basis, that also need to be in some cases like a GTA service we have seen, or a lawyer service, or a sponsorship service. The person who is providing service may be a registered person, then we need to mention on the invoice that the taxes are not payable at his end, but it is payable on a reverse charge basis by the recipient. Then the if you are issuing a digital kind of an invoice, then there should be a digital signature of the authorized person of the supply. Or if you are issuing a physical invoice, then the invoice should contain the signature of authorized person. Any invoice generated by a computer system and having a remark that computer generated and therefore no signature required may not be taken as a evidence by the tax authorities and you may face issues in audits when this will be audited down the line after three years or four years down the line. Then there will be an issue, therefore be careful and ask the seller or a supplier to put a signature either physical signature or a digital signature on the invoices which are either provided in digital form or physical form respectively. Uh, for IT industry, uh, employee are the main asset of the business. So therefore the transaction between the employee and employer uh, are also important to look into from the GST compliance perspective. Uh, as we know that uh, any service provided by employee to the employer under a contract of employment is not, not a supply. So there is no tax on that. Uh, but the services provided by employer to the employee and charge any consideration towards that service is chargeable in the hands of the employer. And proper invoice need to be generated for it. And it should be paid along with the monthly returns. So uh, there are uh, day to day uh, these kind of transactions we need to analyze and see that whether they are really a supplier. So GST, we know that is applicable on all goods and supply, uh, services supplied for a consideration. And even the consideration is not charged, still GST is payable in certain cases. One of that is any transaction between related parties or related persons. So employer and employee, are treated as a related parties. Therefore, this transaction, even if done without consideration, any supply is made without any consideration by employer to employee need to be checked whether this is payable to tax. Uh, so I have done um, 
small exercise under which um, and check that which are the services which will be uh, chargeable, which are the transaction which will be chargeable to tax, which are the transaction which will not be chargeable to tax uh, in next few slides. So the following kind of uh, transactions which are mentioned on this uh, slide are not taxable. So GST is not payable on this. Anything which which is provided under a contract of employment and in a consideration of that service provided by employee, if employee is receiving anything from the employer under that contract, then probably that can be seen as a consideration towards the services provided by the employee and therefore uh, it's a, it's a part of the contract of employment and therefore it should not be treated as a supply. Uh, the FAQ which is provided in this regard seems to have taken a different step where the government is saying anything paid in money that need to be treated as a service provided by employee to the employer and anything apart from that to be treated as well, that views is contentious one can debate on that and probably further clarity need to be achieved on this uh, by seeking clarification from the CBC board. Anyway, the government has allowed, uh, this is ex explicit exemption, that the gifts or awards which are less than 50,000, any reward or gifts which is given to the employee by the employer and which is less value of that gift is less than 50,000 in, in in any given financial year, then uh, there is no tax payable on this. This is exempt supply. But the employer will not be eligible to take credit of such goods which are purchased and given as a gift. So whatever you give as a free of charge, no tax credit to be taken on that, that kind of service. So anything which is in relation to employee welfare, any services which are provided by employer to employee and which are procured from outside the organization probably the employer might have paid taxes on these kind of services GST is paid but the input credit is not allowed because the welfare kind of activities are not eligible for any input credit however the referral fee free medical insurance given to employee and member free personal accident insurance health checkup or subsidized free food provided, free bus pick up and drop, free temporary or permanent residential accommodation. If these are a part of contract of employment, probably the tax should not be asked on this because this is one way. Uh, but the employer is not eligible to take any credit of these services he procured from the medical insurance company or personal insurance company or a health checkup lab laboratory. So uh, the employer is not eligible to take input credit. However, the free service need not to be valued and any tax on that need not to be paid to the government. However, the GST, there is a applicable on certain kind of transaction between the employer and the employee. When there is a notice paid, so there is a view that this is a breach of contract and liquidated damages or damages compensation towards the breach of contract is chargeable to tax. And in fact, this similar kind of breach of contract happened with the government. Government is one of the party in that case, they got an exemption notification for it. So there is a two types of views flowing in the industry that notice pay recovery whether chargeable to tax because it's a part of the employment contract and therefore should not be asked for and this cannot be treated as a service because it's mandatory for the employer to give a notice period to the employee or to get it some kind of a leeway because he cannot ask the employees to work for him against their will. So that is by law is prohibited and therefore these kind of notice pay recovery or these are alternative methods by way of which the employee can get really 
himself, release himself on the employment contract. And for that purpose, uh, it seems that many of the, uh, there is a divided view on this, many of the organizations are taking a view that this is not chargeable to tax and a few other organizations are paying taxes on this kind of, but one and need to take a call on these kind of services and classify it appropriately as a taxable or taxable. Employment reimbursement, as we said that unregistered purchases, this is payable under a reverse charge. Uh, sale of laptops or a old car or any business sale to the employees against the consideration is chargeable to tax. Sitting free commission paid to non-executive directors. Executive directors anyway employees of the company, therefore no tax to be paid a uh, charge to their commission or their salary. But uh, the commission paid to the non-executive director is chargeable to tax under reverse charge. And when the employees are deputed to subsidies or group companies, when that will be a service by one company to another and therefore taxes need to be paid. So this is what a uh, presentation in respect totally focus on the IT industry. And if you have any queries, clarification, please uh, check it and write to CII on the email address which is given earlier. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, clarify your queries. But uh, again, I would like to tell everybody that you should watch the updates which are coming up from the government, the new notifications. Uh, this need to be deliberated, discussed among the your peers or maybe industry players. And collectively, we need to take a stand on certain position, refer to the government if there are some kind of confusion prevent. This is a journey where everybody is learning. And uh, the government is also on our side. So both of us need to make it successful. And maybe after two years, when things get, get uh, one or two years, when the things get settled, uh, everybody will say that this is something a very, very big step India has taken. The whole world is looking after uh, this transformation. So let us make it successful. Thank you very much.